Thompson and his wife Christine, and we're going to ask him to just come have a visitor with us that is uh, going to be bringing the word for three Sundays in the, the month of May, and that's Reverend Ray Cowson and his wife Christine. And we're going to ask him to just come forward for a minute. Before he begins to speak, I'd like to introduce him to those of you who might not know Ray. Hello. I will, I'll probably still call him Ray to the day he dies. I don't know why my Ukrainian brain cannot put Roy in there. Roy, very glad to have you this morning. I know I'm glad to be here, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> So you can tell that he's much older than me, but his brain is still working, at least a little, right? Uh, Roy, uh, where do you come from? Glasgow. A and, and why did you end up coming to Canada and leaving Glasgow? I think we both believed that it was the Lord's call to come to this great nation. Did you come when you were young or when you were... I did. How old? 35. Well, how old are you now? That's okay. We, we don't need to hear that one. Um, were you a minister all your life, or did you begin in a different profession? I began in a different profession. Which was? Which was just working in sales and marketing and traveling the country and selling different commodities. And, and what changed your mind? God. He did. He confronted both Christine and I in the same day at the same service, when she was told that I would be going into ministry and at the same time I was in a different part of the church and the Lord laid it very clearly upon my heart that this was the direction that I was to take. So you then went to seminary? I went to university. I first of all had to go and get courses in a college like this. I was a high school dropout. All I had done in school was play soccer and chase girls. <clears throat> in that order. <laughs> And uh, so I had to start picking up education before I was able to attain the level to be acceptable in a university. And, and where did you get the money to do that? The government in the UK at that point gave you a grant. And when you went to seminary, did somebody help you get... No seminaries in Britain. Oh. It's universities. Oh. So, because they were originally the theological colleges and they've just expanded. What I'm trying to say is that your wife put you through and you're not telling me that. How many years did your wife work to put you through? <laughs> six years. Six years. And she, was, she was a house mother in a children's home. We lived in a children's home with 16 children. And I went to university and back every day and she looked after the 16 children. Then she had me to look after when I came home. And we were... And, and, and I've looked after her ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and how many years have you ministered in Canada? About 33. Okay, was it all in the Comox Valley? It was four in the Comox Valley and the rest of the time in Ontario. And then I had eight years just recently back, six years just recently back in Scotland. And, and you've retired here? I've retired here, yes, yes. Now I we, love it. We've heard that you're, you're, you're training to run a half marathon. When I told these folks, they, they didn't think you could do it at your age, but... Oh, he did, did he? Really? I see. <laughs> when is the half marathon if we want to come and cheer? Mid-June, mid-June. Mid-June. All right, yeah. we will put an announcement... It's here in the in local the valley. Can you run with a cane? He, <laughs> he uh, uh, this, this man, Roy, lives just uh, a block away from my place, and I see him steaming by my house, uh, practicing for his marathon. He can run a lot farther than I, as a younger man, can run. And uh, so I plan to be on the sidelines, either uh, with, with one of those heart, sh heart th <laughs> machines, you know, or, or a stretcher. But... But I'm going to be there. Oh, I'm going to be there when Roy runs his half marathon. No, my idea is to bring you with me. 
We are delighted to have you with us. Thank uh, you. Roy is retired, uh, but is, as you can tell, his mind is keen, and uh, we appreciate the ministry that he's done in this church up to this point, and we are grateful that you are going to minister to us in this month. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray, shall we, just for a few moments. Lord, we thank you that we can come into this place and we can sing and praise and just uh, give you the worship that is due because you are worthy of it all and even more. Lord, as we come to look at your word again today, we know that there is so much to contain, that your word will forever be for us a mystery that we will never unravel fully. It will always be like looking through a glass dimly. But Lord, what you can give us, we want to receive. And so we ask you, Lord, today to fill us up so that the week that we have that lies ahead, you will have given us sufficient of yourself, your anointing and your empowerment to enable us to live and to share the good news of the gospel that we've been singing about already today. And we ask this again, always in Christ's name. Amen. I'm a member of a, a, a Wednesday evening Bible study. And on Wednesday evening, we had a guest. He'd never been before. He was, he, you may know him, some of you. You may have had your children who might even know him better. It, his name is Alf Bain. He's 97 years of age. He and his wife, Margaret, were the founders of Camp Homewood on Quadra Island. But what I didn't know was that before that, for 27 years, he and his wife, Margaret, had lived on a boat. And the boat sort of went up and down the BC coast, uh, calling in at different communities and logging camps and, and different camps here, there, and everywhere, up and down the coast. And as they did that, they were given the opportunity to go into schools and spend a couple of hours in classrooms with kids. And there they would show slide presentations and they would oft offer, um, what do you call these, flannel graph presentations in order to share the story of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what amazed me was when he said that for that first 27 years on the boat, he and his wife only spent two years of that 27 at home at Christmas. Every other year, they were away somewhere up the coast, sharing the Christmas story with those who would hear them and those who would listen, spending time in the schools again, just making sure that boys and girls, young people, would hear the gospel. When we were thinking about it, we recognized that things have changed, haven't they? You wouldn't have the same access today, to, especially in the school system. And I don't know about you, but over the last number of years, I've begun to be concerned about what was looking as though for me, the, the lights, the, the lights of the church, the lights within Christian community were beginning to go out. Things were changing dramatically, not only in the community around us and society, but also in church. When we've been going around different churches, I, I tend to keep my eye open what's happening when the Bible is being read, for example. That's the moment that most people pull out their church bulletin and they start to read. It's the moment I see other people pulling out their phone to have a quick sneak peek to see if there is anybody who has been texting or wanting to get their attention. I was talking to a local minister the other day there, not in an evangelical church, in one of the, the more formal orthodox churches. And this pastor said to me that uh, young people are no longer interested in coming to my church. They said that they had not had any infant baptisms in two years, simply because young people today, when they get married or live together and have children, that the last thing on their mind is church that it never even enters into their conscious decision-making. And I know of three denomination churches in Port Alberni that are closing, and they're linking into one building, three denominations merging together. And so all over 
this country as well as in the United States, it's as though the lights are going out, churches are closing. Not many people are excited about going to church. Even in evangelical circles that I knew when I was in Scotland a few years ago, these evangelical churches were saying that they get transferred membership, but they don't get anybody accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and going through the waters of baptism and joining the church. It is not happening today. So whatever has changed, what has changed? Because it's not the way that I read of church back in the book of Acts in the early chapters. My grandfather, or both my grandfathers on both sides, were evangelists. When I came along, only one of them was still practicing as an evangelist, and I would go with him. Now, this is a way back in the 50s. And I would hear him say and talk about the desire for revival. And yet here we are today, all these years further on, and we would tend to say, oh, if only we could go back to the good old days. And here they were in the good old days wanting it to go back to the good old days. And I wonder how long back do we have to go until we come to the best of days. And surely that would be found in the book of Acts. And so that's what I want to do this morning is, is not to preach to you, but is to have a conversation. I might preach the next two occasions I'm here, but today just to have a conversation, to walk through a few verses in the early chapters of Acts and see what we can discern. Because what I'm going to say to you today is, and I will say something similar each time under the same heading and the same title, that I believe that one of the one of the realities that is missing in the Christian experience in the Christian church and in the Christian folk like you and I is the power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives and in our midst. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And so I have here for the, on the screen a couple of verses from different scriptures. And I want to begin, first of all, in John chapter 4. You know the story. It's the woman at the well, and Jesus is thirsty, and he asks for a drink. And uh, there we read here that Jesus says, he says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Whoever drinks the water will never thirst. I remember back in these old days, we used to sing a chorus. And I've put it up here, if we can turn to the next slide. Does anybody remember, especially the last little few verses, does anybody know that? What, never thirst again? No, never thirst again? No? No? Well, I'll sing it to you. All right? It was, we, this was when we were boys and girls, and this verse or this story would be being told, and we were ex expressly told that Jesus, when he came into our life, that we would, we would never want anything anymore. It would always be available to us, and we had to sing this little chorus that went, what, never thirst again, no, never thirst again, what, never thirst again, no, never thirst again. But whoso drinketh, Jesus said, shall never ever thirst again. Bet you're glad you never asked me to be a soloist. <laughs> All right. Do you want to try it? Come on. All right. What, never thirst again? No, never thirst again. What, never thirst again? No, never thirst again. But who so drinketh, Jesus said, shall never ever thirst again. Now let me ask you a question then. Has that ever happened to you? Have you got to the stage or the space or times in your life, seasons in your life, where you were more thirsty, where you felt there was more, or you longed for more, or there was an emptying, an emptying within you, and you were desperate for more? And, and that's why I'm glad when you come into the next few chapters in chapter 7, that Jesus on the Feast of Tabernacles stands up. And he shouts out, Is anyone thirsty? Let them come to me and drink. And Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom 
Those who believed him, him were later to receive. And so Jesus, I believe, here is giving an insight into what it is like for the Christian life, what it is like for the Christian church to be when they are filled with the streams of life-giving water that will flow out of our bellies and pour out on other people. You know, one of the things about the church that I think, well, it's actually, if you think about it clearly, it's one of the things about the Lord Jesus Christ that when you notice early on in the early chapters, especially in the book of Mark, that you realize that Jesus' life, Jesus himself, it is supernatural. It is not normal. It doesn't appear to be just like you and me. There's a difference in Jesus. He is able to see into the very heart of individuals. He is able to have supernatural vision. He's got supernatural knowledge. And I believe that that at the ends of every day or the beginnings of every day when he goes off to to pray with the Father in order to be strengthened afresh every day, that Jesus also has a supernatural sort of um, way of wanting to make sure that he has this time with the Lord. And so one of the reasons that I think the light is going out of the church is because we've lost this sense of the supernatural. We've lost hold of what was so real for the early church. And as we take time to look at that, we'll go into Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, right at the very beginning of the chapter. You'll remember Jesus is about to ascend. It's the last few words that he will speak while he's on earth and this side of time. And the disciples are concerned about him. They want to know what's going to happen in the future. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. You see, I think that at this point, Jesus is saying, listen, you've been with me for three and a half years. You believe in me. You trust in me. It's very clear the disciples believed in him. Peter himself confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. But we also know what happened around the cross. They disappeared. They they were not where Jesus expected them or wanted them to be. They had fled. And so these were very, very human people. And I think Jesus, knowing that he's going to commission them to carry on the gospel, he needs them to be supernaturally endowed. And that's why in verse 8 he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, then you will be my witnesses. And what we see in the early part of the book of Acts is that they go out and what a harvest they have. Every time it appears that they open their mouth to speak and to lift up the name of Jesus and to explain who he is, that people come to Christ in their multitudes, in their droves. And if you plot the way through the beginning chapters of Acts, the church is forever growing. It's forever expanding. And that's not happening in our day, especially in the Western world. It probably is happening in other parts of the world that we often read about and hear about and long for that to happen here. And so if we take time now and move a little bit forward um, into chapter 2, we notice there the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We know all about that in chapter 2 when they said said they were in this upper room and what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Back when we came to Canada at first, I was a minister in the United Church. In this little village church, beautiful little village, beautiful little community, the boys still long to be back there in those days. And of course, having been trained in university and academic as well as theological studies, I gave to that congregation everything I knew, everything I thought I had learned. I deposited it every Sunday in front of them. And then it came to the point after about three years, I'd given it all. I'd emptied my briefcase of everything that I had to share. And then I said to the Lord, what do I do now? What is there left? And so I covenanted with him 
that I would go down to my church every morning, every weekday morning, Monday to Friday. Now, the church was only about 200 yards down the road, so it was easy to get to, even when the snow was up to your armpits in the winter, because this was January that I did this. And so I would go down, and I would sit in the big, big chair behind the communion table. And as I sat there, I would read scriptures, and I would pray, and I would say, Lord, there has to be something more. I'm empty. I'm struggling. Surely there has to be something that you have promised in this living water that, that I'm not fully grasping. And so for all of the weeks, right through January, February, into March, and it came into Holy Week, eventually I was still going and sitting in that table, and I would read, and I would pray, and I would long for what it was that I did believe that the Lord had for me until I think it was on Good Friday morning. No, it wasn't. It was Monday, Thursday morning. I was sitting there, and I'd done it all again, and I thought, gosh, is this going to take me forever? So I closed my Bible, and I stood up, and I said, okay, Lord, I surrender. If you don't want me to have whatever it is that I believe that is available, that's all right with me. And at that moment, there was a filling that I can't explain that there was an empowering or an anointing that, can, that I can only describe similar to what was taking place in these early days in the book of Acts. I didn't see tongues of fire. There wasn't a blowing of a mighty wind, but there was a, it was like oil from on high coming all the way through my experience. And so I went back out the following Sunday or, the sun, or throughout that Holy Week weekend and into the future. It was the same kind of pre I'm, I'm the same guy. Same kind of preaching. Same Bible. Nothing changed. But there was a change. That particular Easter weekend, one of the local ladies in the community gave her life to the Lord for the very first time in that church in my three years' experience. And from then on, the church began to grow. And I would say that in that little community, we had our own mini revival because it changed me. And we were able to impart that to other people. And so I'm wondering this morning as we, you know, if we, if, if we had more time, I would go through lots more in the book of Acts. But I want to take you just into chapter 4. Remembering that these apostles have been filled with the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. And, and within, I don't know, must have been maybe minutes that people outside think they're drunk. There is something strange about them. But they weren't drunk. It was just an experience of joy, an experience of ecstasy that was changing these disciples into men and women who were able to proclaim and lift up the name of Jesus in such a powerful way that people responded. And by the end of that day, 3,000 people were saved. Peter, think about him. These were, these were men who were uneducated, totally unlearned. Peter was a fisherman, nothing special about him. In fact, I don't think Pastor Dave would invite him to preach, not at this moment in time, because not only had he denied Jesus, but he had swore that he really never knew him. And so I can imagine Pastor Dave at this point saying, okay, put your hands together. Here comes Peter. He's going to speak to you. But what a powerful sermon he preached. You know that when I think about it today compared to then, in our day, if 3,000 people came forward, we would be hurrying to give them New Testaments or we would be hurrying to give them tracts to take home with them. But in those days, they had nothing, absolutely nothing. And so they totally and completely had to depend upon the Lord. And the Lord came through for them time and time again. Chapter 4. And maybe at this point we'll come to a completion. Chapter 4. Peter and John have been arrested. They have been questioned. They were asked not to speak or teach again in the name of Jesus. Now they know the power 
that, 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 that is held by, by these religious authorities. After all, they'd made sure that Jesus was taken to the cross. So Peter and John know that their life could be forfeit at any moment. And, G, and, and, and Peter and John replied to them, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. And eventually they were released. And when they went back to their own people, they, they, they told them what had happened. And they started to pray. And this is what they said, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. But they were filled. They were filled in Acts chapter 2. They were already filled with the Holy Spirit. So why is Peter and John and the apostles again at this point being filled again with the Holy Spirit? I, I wondered about that back a number of years ago until eventually I was taken to a place in Toronto that you may have heard of. It was uh, the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship what it was known as the Toronto Blessing. And we were fortunate. We lived about two hours north, and Christine and I would go down on a Friday, and uh, we would go to the big assembly. It was most unusual experience having to queue up or line up to get into a church service and to compete with hundreds to get a good seat. But I used to go down on a Wednesday sometimes. But the first time I ever went, I was taken by a colleague of mine who was in a, a fellowship church. And he took myself, and he took a Christian Reformed pastor, and he took a Presbyterian pastor. And it was at the time when they hadn't moved from the small building right at the end of the runway at Toronto Airport. It hadn't really become as world famous, but it certainly was famous. And so we walked in the door, and all the praise music was over. It was ended. And as we walked in the door, the speaker, whose name was Mark DuPont, an American, and he said to David, my friend that had brought us, he said, oh, Hi, David. Sorry you're late, but try and get a room to come in. Bring your Who are your friends anyway? And so David introduced us, and Mark said, Well, I'm glad that you're here, and may the Lord just bless you. That's what he did. May the Lord bless you. And suddenly the three of us are lying on the floor. We are not out cold. We're aware of what has happened. But he has done, I don't know, I can't express it or explain it. But there was a way in which I knew the Lord had laid me on the ground to fill me up again. And so what I see here is these apostles, these disciples of Jesus who are emptying themselves out in their preaching. Just before we read that in chapter 3, they have um, touched a lame man and they've, they've, they've told him that they don't have any money to give, but what they have, they would give him and in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And he went into the temple leaping and jumping and praising God because he got all of his strength back. Remember in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it tells us that we've not to be drunk on wine because that leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. And if you read the correct language, it says, be being filled with the Spirit. In other words, that we are to continually go to the fountain to receive and to be filled with the Spirit of God continually. And so that's what I want to share with you in this sort of little conversation this morning, that I do believe that one of the reasons that we see lights going out in churches all over the place. When I was in Scotland, I was in a committee within the Church of Scotland that was looking at the future, and the future of the Church of Scotland, which is the longest-serving Presbyterian system in the world, started way back in 1652, that by the year 2029, 20, they believe there will be no Christian presence at all. Now, I'm hearing that in other places, not just Scotland. And so I do believe, like, like, 
I think it's easy to do church. Once you've gone to a theological college, you can preach. You can lead Bible studies. Maybe it doesn't look easy, but it gets to be easy. But I don't want to do it in my own strength. I don't want to do it with my own intellectual ability. I think it's easy to get up here if you've got a voice and you know something about music to play music or to lead people in hymns. But I'm sure that those who do it here don't want just to be doing that. They want to be in harmony and in concert with the Holy Spirit so that when they do lead worship here that that there's a, a response from people that's drawing you in to the very heart of God. Is that not what you long for? You know, I sometimes think, why are pastors not more disheartened? Why are they not more upset? Why are they not taking time to ask God, what's wrong? What's going wrong? Why are we not seeing more people come to Christ? Can we pray? Can we pray? Now, you've got to open your heart up to the Lord. I'm not asking you to do anything. You know who you are. You know if there is a sense of dissatisfaction within, or you just need a little bit of a shake-up and say, Lord, I've let it go. I've let it go. You know, we don't need to wait like I did for so long in that church, trying to discover what it is that the Lord had for me. Holy Spirit's here. Holy Spirit's here. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, it will be the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, the fullness, the energy, the dynamo of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for each one of us as I pray for myself. Lord, that you would fill us again with the empowering of your Spirit so that when we speak to somebody in the community, that we will sense that there's, an, there's a source deep within that is letting flow a river of water that will bring life. Lord, we want to be able to not just have conversations with people, but speak life. It seems that in this community, young people are more interested in crack than Christ. And so, Lord, may there be people here who have a special anointing for young people who can reach them with the love of the Savior and draw them to himself. Lord, for those we've mentioned here this morning who are, who are suffering, whether it's, whether it's a scar or a heart or leukemia and going through all the different treatments, Lord, we, we lift them up. We, we want to not only preach with a holy boldness, but pray, Lord, with fervency and ask that you would send forth your healing power upon those who have been named, and we name even others in our hearts right now. And so we pray this. Lord, we remember that the Holy Spirit's function is to convict the world of sin, but also to point to Jesus. And Lord, we point to you this morning. We ask you, Lord, that if there is anyone here today who has come into this place at an invitation or has come here for a couple of weeks and is sitting here and just not sure of what's going on, Lord, help them to look to you. Would you point them to you? Would they hold out their hands towards you and simply ask that you would come and fill them and enter their life and give them that foolish satisfaction that only Jesus gives. And so this we offer and this we pray, all of it in and through the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.